Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it is my pleasure to invite uh, Laura Battini uh, for this QCMFP webinar. Uh, I think this is the first one in this year. Uh, so Laura is now a PhD student in uh, Jürgen Berges group in Heidelberg, Germany. And uh, she is going to discuss real-time dynamics of false vacuum decay. So Laura, please, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, so thank you very much for the introduction. And again, thanks a lot for the invitation to give this talk. Uh, today, I'm going to discuss uh, how to get relevant observables, uh, studying the quantum dynamics in field theory regarding the topic of false vacuum decay. So uh, this work um, has been re recently published, so you can find everything in here. And uh, it's based on a collaboration with Alexandre Chatrochan, who's now a postdoc at Nordnit in Sweden, and my supervisor, Jürgen Berges, uh, in Heidelberg. So let me start uh, with some introduction of uh, uh, what I mean by false vacuum decay in field theory and motivate why we need uh, real-time methods to describe it uh, properly. So uh, imagine we have, uh, we have a a field, a scalar, and a real valued phi, which lives in a potential B of phi, which looks like here in this box. So if you are above the critical temperature Tc, this, the field just sits at rest in the minimum of this potential. But then if the temperature gets lowered uh, below the critical temperature, then it may happen as in the phenomenon of supercooling that the system is trapped in this uh, local minimum now, which is usually referred to as the false vacuum in contrast to the global uh, ground state of the system, which is the true vacuum. Now, um, in a classical world, this uh, would just stay there forever and would be stable. But uh, in the presence of fluctuations, it is not stable, but it's made stable. And therefore, it's, uh, even if it's long lived, it will eventually decay. And this can be due to thermal fluctuations, for example, that lift it over the barrier and then the field may roll down and show some dynamics until it reaches this true uh, vacuum state. Uh, but it's also possible that the system uh, uh, goes uh, to the other side uh, uh, through the barrier. And this is the case of tunneling that also can be somehow generalized to the finite temperature tunneling. And after the field uh, comes up uh, to the other side, then the field again rolls down, shows some trivial dynamics and, uh, and settles down here. Now, uh, so we, what we have in mind to describe is a first order phase transition uh, in time and uh, Therefore, we need a suitable order parameter for this transition, which we identify as the field expectation value. Now, uh, since we are, we are talking about, about a system which has fluctuations present, then um, um, we cannot really use the bare or classical potential to describe uh, this, because uh, these uh, fluctuations will renormalize this potential. And, and therefore, the proper a description will be uh, using the effective action uh, such that instead of in the classical world, we uh, find the stationary points, which are the vacuum of the theory by, uh, by uh, taking the derivative of this effective potential. Now we have uh, uh, now the corrected one that in the case of constant fields just gives us these two vacuum states where now I labeled it as phi plus for the false vacuum and phi minus for the true vacuum. Now, uh, still so far, we were considering some case where the field uh, expectation value was all in, all in one phase. Um, but of course, um, there's the possibility that there are some macroscopic regions of this field, which are already in this true vacuum state and are separated uh, uh, from the uh, background field of the false vacuum, such that the average of this field is, the, is in this mixed state where this parameter here, P, is telling you how much uh, of the fraction of the system is in the, in the true vacuum and in the false vacuum. And for this mixed state, the effective potential actually has uh, some lower energetical value and is uh, constructed in a similar way. And therefore, the full effective potential uh, does not have a barrier in between these two phases, but is, com uh, is constructed from the convex hull and, uh, and therefore um, uh, does not have a barrier in between. Now, this can be regarded as the field theoretical generalization of the Maxwell construction. So uh, here I put some um, uh, classical analog 
of what I'm talking about in the sense that for the liquid vapor transition, for example, in equilibrium, this blue uh, uh, region just represents exactly what I was talking about before. So this uh, coexistence of these two phases at once, and therefore this line, which uh, used to be non-convex, actually it's flat uh, during this uh, transition from the liquid to vapor phase uh, below this critical line. Now, everything I said, uh, applies to equilibrium in principle and can be uh, this effective potential can be computed for example using the functional renormalization group flow methods but we would like now to extend this as much as possible to non-equilibrium situations and recover this effective potential in our numerical simulations so therefore what we what we want to do is to rephrase the problem as an initial value problem in time, where we specify some initial conditions at initial time, and then we track the evolution in time of the field expectation value, which is the one point function, but also higher order correlation functions. So uh, in, let's say, if you would run an experiment, you would see for each experimental run, experimental shot, that the field decays through this, uh, um, uh, nucleation of these bubbles of the true vacuum, which then expand, collide, and merge and have all their non trivial dynamics. But then, if you consider now the expectation value, which is like this uh, also volume average, you would see that it evolves from this false vacuum state. Then it, it's really this is what uh, was in the previous slide. So, this mixture of these two phases uh, and then dynamically comes until this. Uh, uh, the, the, the completion of this uh, phase transition where the system uh, finds itself in the true vacuum. In particular, uh, we uh, want to deal with some non-equilibrium phase transition. And what's the, what's the new thing is that in general, uh, we have two fundamental uh, time scales of the system. One time scale is associated to the transition to the true vacuum. So this transition time scale, while the other one is how much the system needs to equilibrate in case that we initialize it with some general non-equilibrium conditions. And if these two timescales are not so different from each other, it may happen that we have some, uh, in general, time dependence of our quantities. So this may be the case in some early universe inflationary models, if we are not in thermal equilibrium at all times, or if we have some system where, that we quench uh, initially, and then the system does not have enough time to, let's say, thermalize before it, this uh, first order transition occurs. So um, as I was saying, as a result, we have that our decay rate of the system and also the effective potential, which is associated to that, might have this time dependence and therefore one single number cannot be uh, enough to just uh, capture all the complexity of this, uh, of this process. And then the advantage of this method is that in principle by studying in time the evolution of the correlation function, these are uh, observables that can be measured also in conductum experiments. Now, since we want to match in the end our results to uh, some reference value or some uh, and compare to uh, what has been calculated uh, already. Uh, I just summarize in this slide uh, the uh, instant donor Euclidean formalism that gives us our uh, some prediction for the decay rate of the system. Now the decay rate, so the transition probability per unit of time per unit of volume, is dominated by this exponential factor of the uh, Euclidean action evaluated in advance if we use this saddle point approximation. And now what we're interested in is some case where we have a very high temperature of the system and therefore before of because of dimensional uh, reduction, we can write this Euclidean action as the three-dimensional one divided by the effective temperature of the system. Now, because we started uh, in the first place with three plus one dimensions. And on top of that, one usually uh, assumes that uh, this uh, bounce is spherically symmetric in space, and therefore the classical Euclidean equation of motion reduces to this uh, uh, nonlinear differential equation um, that one can solve numerically using, for example, the shooting method. And as a result, one gets um, the, the inverse time scales of the transition and also some information on these bubbles that are nucleated locally in space. Uh, that the interior is uh, the true vacuum, and then they're separated from uh, this background of the false vacuum by this bubble wall. Now, 
the point now is that we want to compare this to our real-time predictions for the decay rate and for the potential. So, for example, regarding the nucleation, we had this, the, this Euclidean method is telling us some quantitative information about the bubbles and about the, um, um, in, in some, in some uh, uh, approximation that regards some symmetries on the particular shape of this, uh, of these bubbles. But of course, it would be uh, better to have in one go the observe really this nucleation of these bubbles and also follow the subsequent dynamics without any symmetry assumption. Um, and, uh, and then most importantly, we would like to then compare what is the decay rate, which in general is time dependent. Um, so the prediction in the Euclidean framework, as we said, is dominated by this exponential factor. And, but here we need some input from our real-time simulations in the sense that this Euclidean action is now dependent on some uh, effective potentials, which is corrected uh, because of the fluctuations and also the effective temperature of the system. Again, that might be in general time dependent, um, ha have to be uh, somehow computed uh, using our real-time method to properly match the two results. And then, of course, we need to understand how to compute in a different fashion the decay rate using real time, uh, our real time results, and then uh, ask ourselves uh, if these uh, two rates are going to agree uh, on a quantitative uh, level. Now, because we need uh, some uh, uh, to describe our initial value problem. We need to use uh, the formalism of non-equilibrium quantum field theory, which is in general is uh, um, formulated along this uh, schwinger kardish close time contour, C, which is made of these two branches, the forward branch, C plus, and then comes back to the initial time T naught via this backward branch C minus. And um, this is intuitively motivated by the fact that if we have a observable O, uh, it's expectation value is uh, um, uh, um, computed from the uh, initial conditions, which are encoded in the density matrix row naught. And then we have this evolution operators, which uh, go from T naught to a certain time T, and then this one brings it back to the initial time. So in the uh, path integral formulation, we have that our generating functional for the correlation functions that we want to compute, can be written very schematically in this way, where S0 and L is the non-interacting part of the action and then the interacting part. And these are both uh, written in the time integral uh, using this uh, uh, closed time contour. And in particular here, I write this in terms of uh, the field phi and the field phi tilde, which are uh, some linear combinations of this phi plus and phi minus fields uh, taken along these uh, branches. Now, the important part is that this interaction action depends on these two vertices, where the first one is the so-called classical vertex, where we have three uh, solid lines, which uh, are represent this uh, uh, classical field and one dashed line, which is the quantum field, while the quantum vertex is exactly the opposite. So three, three uh, phi tilde fields and one single phi, phi field. And so, I mentioned that because then, since uh, we are interested uh, later in the uh, quantumness of our evolution, in the classical statistical approximation that uh, can be applied in the case of weak couplings or high occupancies, one can simulate this numerically very conveniently by solving the classical evolution equations and put the quantumness in the initial conditions. And this will com uh, comprehend only this vertex here in this red box. And then one reconstructs uh, the correlation functions by sampling over many realizations. So this will be um, very convenient if we want to now uh, apply it to the case where we deal with some finite temperature tunneling and compare uh, quantitatively to the Euclidean result. Now, before I come to the, to the, to the result part, let me just uh, first introduce the last bit of uh, uh, theory. In fact, uh, now, if you want to simulate the full quantum dynamics for this initial value problem, 
uh, we can use also the two particle irreducible effective action, which is uh, this double Legendre transform from this connected, gen connected generating functional, which is uh, dependent on the logarithm of C, and is a functional of the linear source J and the bilinear source R. Now, um, uh, one obtains the uh, evolution equations for the one point function phi and the two point function connected two point function G by taking the stationary points uh, in, when uh, the sources are vanishing of this uh, 2 pi effective action. Now, this is the most schematic uh, form of these equations. Of course, they can be unpacked and written in a uh, longer way, but uh, just uh, for the understanding, uh, the, from here you get some coupled equations for the one and two point functions. And if you provide with some initial conditions, you can study the full dynamics. Now, of course, um, one is a proper truncation of this effective action. And uh, so this uh, um, gamma can be written in general um, for uh, in terms of the uh, uh, their action, the one loop contributions, and the two PI diagrams that can be truncated using the one over n uh, expansion uh, to next to leading order, where n is now the number of field components. So, as I said before, we want to use now uh, these uh, two PI evolution equations to compare really uh, the quantum quantum dynamics to the classical statistical limit. Uh, statistical limit. Now, um, now uh, let me come to the first part of the results. And uh, in this sense, we uh, just chose uh, a distilled double well, so a negative mass squared and then a positive lambda, and then a J term, which was this linear source, which uh, breaks this uh, Z2 symmetry and makes it uh, possible to have this uh, metastable state uh, in, um, at first. We initialize our field in the vicinity of this uh, a local minimum, and then put all the fluctuations in the two-point function. Now, uh, we just observe how the field expectation value evolves in time, and we can uh, split this evolution in different uh, stages. So initially, the field just oscillates, and these oscillations are damped because of uh, the phenomenon of parametric resonance. But afterwards, uh, we enter this second regime, which uh, I called a pre-transition. Um, in this phase, you see that the field is still slightly evolving towards smaller values, almost linearly. And in, in this phase, you have this redistribution of the fluctuations from the initial conditions um, towards the IR. Uh, in this phase, the system effectively loses the information about the initial conditions. And we can, um, based on some uh, uh, classical uh, concept of temperature, which is based on the uh, mean kinetic energy per degree of freedom, uh, formulate some um, and use this definition of the effective temperature, which is local in time and also applies uh, in general out of equilibrium uh, based on this uh, average of the kinetic energy, with, which is going to be useful for later. Now, this is uh, right before the transition. And now we come to the transition. You see here that uh, we have uh, all these colored lines which represent single runs of our simulation. And at a certain point, they all show these nucleation events. Now you see here the nucleation of the bubble and the, the expansion. Um, in this case, we have this uh, in this uh, 2D snapshot. Uh, you see just one single one, but of course it's possible for larger grid size to observe multiple bubble productions, which was for example in the title slide. And um, uh, even if this is for one single shot, you see that now this black thick line uh, is that is just the average over a single one. We lose, let's say, this information about uh, this uh, uh, single shot bubble nucleation, but will we'll still represent the phase transition in time, uh, evolving from one state to the other one. Okay, so now um, after this, the field just uh, uh, let's say, thermalizes uh, in, the, in the true vacuum state and, uh, and the transition is completed. Now, what can we learn from this? Um, basically, we want to use this data and this uh, uh, numerical simulations to understand and uh, to probe partially this effective potential. 
the way we want to do it is now uh, to use the fact that now this field expectation value, which in general still has this time dependence, so I put this subscript T um, here at the bottom, uh, will depend on how much we tilt our, uh, our uh, initial potential with this linear uh, source J. So basically by inverting this relation here, we find that in general J will depend on the expectation value of the field at time t. And therefore, by using different j's, we can just uh, measure where the system uh, is at a certain point in time. And this is what uh, is plotted here. Basically, of the field expectation value on the x-axis versus minus the linear source. Now, to understand, to give some meaning to this plot, we are assuming that the effective evolution equation for um, in, this, uh, in this case is such that the field expectation value in this uh, pre-transition time scale and also for later time sits in the minimum of this effective potential, but this effective potential also is evolving in time and therefore also its couplings will be time dependent. And this is just, again, this uh, generalization to the stationarity condition in the presence of the source J. And uh, now in this uh, uh, blue box, you see that for times which are prior to the transition, we can just fit our um, uh, effective coupling, so the effective mass and the effective lambda. Um, by uh, and, uh, and you see that this is uh, still slowly evolving in time. And uh, while uh, for times which are uh, during the transition from one state to the other, we see here, like these blobs are really the numerical data. These are restoring the complexity of this effective potential. Now, um, we will use uh, now this uh, for, for the comparison. What I wanted to say is that now we're still uh, working out how to make this treatment a bit more rigorous in the sense that we would like to reformulate it now in terms of the equal time quantum field theory for the effective actions, because um, these coefficients, uh, so the coefficients of uh, the effective actions or so of this effective potential could be also possible using these cold atom experiments. There is already some results where they extracted the two points, uh, the, 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 the quartic, the two point function and the four point function, which, which are related to this. And uh, it, it would be interesting to see uh, what comes out of this. Now, um, putting all the pieces together, we can calculate from the effective couplings, we get the bounds. And you see that these bounds profiles, which are resulting from, uh, from the couplings we extracted numerically, are also still a bit evolving in time. And of course, this also has an effect on the corresponding three-dimensional action. And uh, together with the effective temperature, you see that this ratio between uh, this uh, action and the temperature is dropping uh, quite, quite consistently. And this enters now our uh, prediction for our uh, decay rate per unit volume, which uh, uh, there is a question, maybe? Hey, <laughs> thanks. Yeah, no, I just had a quick question. So. Um, in the pre-transition phase, you're fitting these coefficients, um, but really you're only sampling the region of the potential around the false vacuum. Exactly. And so I, I guess I that. wanted your take on why do I have the right or why is it a correct picture to imagine then that I can use those constraints about the shape around the minimum to say something about the full bounce profile, which is kind of also probing the full potential, both the minimum and kind of the over the barrier shape of the potential. In other words, what confidence do you have that it we can describe that really within um, the original parameterization, where it's just a m squared and a phi to the four, uh, a phi squared and phi to the fourth term? Yeah, okay. So in general, we don't really know how the effective potential looks like. But as I said before, the full effective potential is also flat in the central region. So the central region is something we cannot really access in our numerics. And therefore, we have to rely on these uh, uh, boundary regions, which are not uh, in where the barrier sits. And therefore, what we do is to try as much as possible with different, different uh, uh, 
values for this linear uh, coupling to probe this region. And then we want to fit, and this is why I put this dash line here, we want to extend it also to the interior. But of course, the interior is something you cannot really um, probe with using this method. Yeah. Thank so the, the, the bounds will depend on these um, couplings, which are in general, we can only probe uh, at the margins uh, how, how uh, yeah, their values, but uh, we assume that and then we extrapolate to, the, to these values. Yeah. But uh, yeah, the emphasis uh, I put uh, before was that uh, actually this interior part is much more ch challenging to, to, to get. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, Yes, so by feeding it uh, in, uh, in the effective potential, we get uh, in the end this uh, um, uh, prediction. Again, I plotted here in, uh, uh, in, in these time ranges, in time range which correspond to this pre-transition pre uh, uh, time scales. And we see that the decay rate now is uh, actually increasing in time and it's doing it, it's doing it uh, uh, in an exponential way. Now we want to compare um, what happens uh, um, uh, actually in, in our real-time dynamics. And it's uh, again, uh, another analysis of the same data in some sense, because another thing we can do is to check what is the survival probability of the system. And to do so, uh, I mean that we can uh, uh, run again many simulations and really detect the formation of these bubbles uh, in locally in space. Basically, one uh, um, what we do actually is to split our grid in a, uh, very small cubes, uh, such that the length of this cube is uh, more or less what we expect from the instant on uh, radi bubble radius, and then we uh, measure at which time the simulation uh, is, is telling us that our first bubble has formed. Now, um, from that, by doing it many times in our ensemble, we can construct a distribution from this data, which is uh, tell, uh, basically telling us how many of these simulations have not decayed at a certain time t, uh, normalized by this total number of simulations. And we are free to do it for different grid size. So that's what we did. And, um, and you see that by increasing the volume that, uh, that we, the grid volume, uh, this distribution of course shifts toward the left because it's uh, uh, easier and faster to see a bubble in a, in a big, if you just uh, double, uh, uh, double your grid size. But um, the important thing is now that if you rescale this distribution, by some reference volume uh, V bar, then this um, uh, rescale probability, now these curves are lying on top of each other. And this is important because we want now to extract our decay rate from here. And we do it uh, by um, uh, taking the derivative in time of this uh, survival probability. And from here, uh, we get the gamma of T. Now, uh, so the first thing is that, uh, this uh, decay rate per unit volume must be volume independent because it's this physical observable cannot depend on the grid that we use. And this is shown by uh, these overlapping regions between these different volumes that we use. And also uh, it's uh, better to use this different grid size in the sense that you're able to probe different time ranges by uh, changing your grid size and by uh, putting all the data together we get one single line, which uh, uh, again covers the pre-transition pre time scales. Um, a last analysis that we can do is um, now uh, focusing on the one point function. So as I said before, we can uh, vary the uh, lattice volume, but of course, uh, after a certain uh, value, these curves, which represent the field expectation value, rescaled, uh, will lie again on top of each other, showing volume independence. And now we focus more on this transition time scale. So from when the field starts to decay until the end. And 
we can just for simplicity, we would like to have some analytical understanding of what's going on. We can use again these two phase approximation such that the field expectation value is now partially in the false vacuum and partially in the true vacuum parameterized by this uh, probability function. Now, this probability function has, uh, has been shown that in general, uh, by taking into account this expansion of these bubbles can be written in this form, where um, basically this uh, R represents the radius of this bubble that has been nucleated at time t prime and then expanded until time t. And uh, uh, again, uh, if we neglect the origin, the, the initial bubble radius, then this uh, can be written as the bubble wall velocity times the difference of the two times. Then there is this uh, uh, factor, which is just the um, decay rate per unit volume at time t prime. And then we have to integrate from some reference volume that we can fix t naught until time t to find this uh, probability function. Now, uh, what we did is uh, we wanted to extract this gamma over V. So uh, we can take derivatives of this I factor. In, par in particular, if you take four derivatives, you can uh, really compute this gamma over V in time. And uh, this uh, basically can be, then depends on the value of the uh, one point function. And then also on this phi plus and phi minus values and the result is here this uh, black thick uh, line. Now we want to see everything together. So in one plot, the result looks like this. Basically, um, you see that uh, in these time ranges, all the, all the decay rates are increasing exponentially uh, in a similar way. And uh, in particular, the one point function prediction and the survival probability are actually uh, agreeing quite well on the quantitative side, while the instant one uh, is slightly shifted from the other two uh, curves. And one reason for that might be that uh, because we are not taking into account all the pre-exponential factors in the instant one, this ki uh, kind of shifts will shift this uh, line uh, higher or lower depending on what you take into account. So this, of course, uh, uh, can make a difference. Okay, so now uh, I come to the to the last part um, that we investigated. So uh, something we were also interested in is uh, to compute really the quantum effects in the dynamics, um, and to do so, we use this uh, two pi one over n to next to leading order to simulate the dynamics. What we do is really to take a similar model. So again, a tilted uh, double wall potential, and again, initialize our field in, uh, in this potential well, such that in general, it can oscillate. And, but this time we don't inject uh, many fluctuations and we, we just provide the vacuum initial conditions and, pro and uh, change this initial field value. So unlike before, we are not in a regime where we can actually compare with some uh, uh, instant on calculation in the sense that we do not approach this pre-termization state or not even something which is closer to equilibrium. So it's a general out of equilibrium dynamics, but we can still ask ourselves if the associated time scale of the transition will have an impact. So will, will this uh, uh, system decay at finite time scales and are they different if we take into account classical statistical, only the classical statistical vertex or the full quantum dynamics. So that's what we did. So we started from some initial conditions such that the evolutions look really identical. So I don't show them in this plot. I just show uh, starting from some threshold value where they, stand, where they start to behave differently. So you see that uh, so the dashed lines correspond to the full quantum 2BI, while the solid lines are uh, this classical statistical within 2BI. And you see that, uh, first of all, the, all the quantum ones are decaying for this choice of initial conditions, while after this threshold value, which is the yellow line, you see that they start to oscillate, but they uh, don't show decay in this, um, in this time, uh, uh, these times that were simulated. So of course they could decay much later, but it, this would be also an indication that the time scales associated to the 
to the transition are much larger than compared to the full quantum evolution. So this might be a, a starting point to probe some uh, non equilibrium uh, first order transitions, which uh, um, and, uh, and probe the quantum phase transition versus some uh, classical statistical phase, phase transition. So what we can conclude is that in this case, these quantum effects are changing qualitatively uh, the dynamics. For example, you see also some irregular oscillations before the decay, and also um, they're uh, aiding in the decay process, making it possible well, where, uh, when the classical statistical uh, does not show the decay. Now, uh, okay, one more question. Hi. Um, yes. So we would have expected the classical statistical approximation to work well um, in the case, as you said, a weak coupling and um, yeah. low occupation number. So one trend I see here, and maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, it seems like the larger the initial displacement, which I would, I would have associated with a larger occupation number, um, seems to be more affected by this quantum dynamics. Maybe you could comment on that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. so um, yeah, first of all, yes. So if you have a larger field amplitudes, you will generate more fluctuations and therefore you're closer to the, this classical statistical limit. Uh, and yes, the classical statistical um, simulations are only valid if you have high occupancies uh, or very large fluctuations. But this one is not uh, the full uh, classical statistical, but it's the classical statistical into PI. And basically what you do is to simulate identical initial conditions, but then you can really cross out the terms which correspond to the quantum vertex, because all these vertices generate some uh, diagrams and some, and then the, the dynamics. And in this sense, you can really uh, cross out these terms and simulate the dynamics. I, it was a bit implicit, but you can, um, you can do that. And in that sense, you will have this uh, classical statistical into BI. And that's well-defined. Uh, Thank you. Does that answer your question? Um, yeah, I think so. Yes. Thanks. Okay. And uh, with that, uh, I am uh, almost done. Let me quickly summarize and conclude. So our goal was to uh, use uh, real-time methods to study the phenomenon of false park in decay. So the first thing is that uh, these uh, fluctuations and the time dependence will uh, um, uh, modify the uh, potential, so we need to take them into account, and we do that by really extracting from our simulations our effective potential, and we use this information to compare to the real-time results for the decay rate, which are showing some uh, uh, qualitative agreement in the time dependence, and also quantitatively they are not so far off from each other. And uh, lastly, we uh, try to uh, put ourselves in a situation to probe really the quantumness in the dynamics of the phase transition, and therefore we use these two particle irreducible effective action, and we find that there are some uh, qualitative difference in the dynamics, uh, which has the implication on uh, on uh, on the on the phase transition. So with that, uh, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, thank you, Laura. Thank you for a nice talk.